All trust you have your outline. We're going to come to a new subject tonight in study of Old Testament theology. We finished Judaism. Now we come to idolatry in Israel. Page 11. Now if you notice under idolatry we have Baalism. There's a reason for that because what we're going to do on page 11 under the next two headings, idolatry and prophetism, we'll not be following the outline so much. Now I'll explain why. First of all, I'll give an introductory study to Baalism, and then I'd like to give an assignment in a Bible encyclopedia for the study of idolatry, because all we're dealing with is one thing, Baalism, and the reason we deal in Old Testament theology studies with Baalism is because, first of all, it typifies idolatry in Israel in a way that none of the other worship of the foreign gods by the Israelites does. Secondly, Baalism was the greatest threat to the survival of Israel that there was. Are you aware that one time there were only 7,000 people in all of Israel? that had not bowed the knee to Baal, according to the word of God. Only 7,000 left. So we study it for that reason. It's typical of idolatry, and there are many forms of it. So I'd like to give an assignment, and then of course we just assume that people do such reading when they can, in Wycliffe's Bible Encyclopedia, or any good Bible Encyclopedia, under the heading, God's False. That means false gods, but it's God's false, the way it's listed. Now, I've written several articles in those two volumes, but this isn't mine. I wrote the article that we just dealt with under festivals, all of the festivals, sacrifices, and sacred seasons. But this article deals with idolatry, you see, and Baalism is just one form. Now, that would be true of any good encyclopedia, but... I think I could pretty well recommend Wycliffe's as a conservative. Under the next point on the outline, we're going to skip for our studies at the church, prophetism. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm assigning part one of my book, Introduction to Old Testament Prophets. Part one covers this in detail. You see, I made this outline before I ever taught my first course in the seminary in Old Testament theology. I introduced the subject at the seminary, in fact, and I had not written the book yet on Old Testament prophets. When I wrote the book, I used my syllabus notes that I taught at the seminary as the basis for the book, but the book is much more detailed than we could give here, and it covers everything on this outline in greater detail than we could give it. And it's up to date. It's after BHS, the Baptism of the Holy Spirit. I wrote the book before I got the baptism. Publisher agreed to publish it. And I got the baptism before I turned the manuscript over to him. So I went back through it and brought it up to date, charismatically. And you'd be surprised the insights I got with the Holy Spirit about prophetic inspiration, I knew it up here, but you see now, since I'd prophesied, having received the Holy Spirit, I knew what words then to use in my book. Well, anyway, it's up to date. There's no point in duplicating what's already in the book, taking the time here. We could be teaching other things because we don't have that long. The Lord's ready to return, and we want to get on with this. And the reason that we assigned that reading about idolatry is because you will get a study of all of idolatry and not just Baalism. Now, let's come to Baalism. The reason, as I said, we're dealing with that as representative of idolatry in Israel is because it constituted, unlike any other heathenism, paganism, idolatry that Israel came in contact with, it constituted the most serious threat. There were two times in Israel's history that she was almost extinguished as a people. That is the threat of it. 
And one was the time of Esther when Haman, you know, decreed that all Jews would be destroyed all over the world. And here's another time during the time of Elijah, Elisha, when as far as Israel was concerned, there were only 7,000. Well, that's only seven times more than maybe is here tonight in the whole nation of Israel that remain true to God. Remember when Elijah said, I, even I only am left? And God said, that's not quite accurate. I have reserved me 7,000 in Israel who have not yet bowed the knee to Baal. Well, that told Elijah that he was one of 7,000. That's not very many. What if God said, I've only got 7,000 in America? Well, how do you know that he doesn't have but 7,000? Now, no one likes to think in those terms, of course, but I do know one thing. A lot of people are going to be surprised on the day of reckoning. Just because you come to faith assembly doesn't mean that you'll be numbered among those 144,000 or 7,000 or whatever number God has made up. He says in Romans 11, one day the time will come when the fullness of the Gentiles will come in, the full number. Now, I don't know how many there are, but we're Gentiles, at least most of us. So you better get with it while you can. There's a certain number. By the way, God said, I reserve myself 7,000. That's interesting. Well, this is what we're saying. This constituted the greatest threat to Israel. It got down to the place where there were only 7,000. Elijah didn't think there were any. And he was a prophet of God. So it was a very small number. Of all the forms of idolatry, this is the worst. That's why we deal with it. The greatest threat to Israel. Now, the influence of Baalism is to be seen in the fact that over six chapters of the first book of Kings is devoted to the reign of Ahab and his wife Jezebel, who, as if you remember your studies in Old Testament introduction that we gave you, they are the ones who brought Baalism into Israel to begin with. And six chapters are devoted to Ahab's reign with his wife Jezebel, and only a half a chapter for all the other kings. That ought to tell you something about the importance of this period of Elijah Ahab, Ahab's reign. Now, exceptions would be David and Solomon, of course, but that's to be expected. They would have more treatment. And the only explanation is the presence of Baalism is why such an extensive treatment is given to this particular reign of this king, King Ahab. Now, Baalism, as you study the Old Testament, you find it's not just another religion with which Israel came into contact. But under the influence of Ahab and his wife Jezebel, it became the state religion. Now we could take the time to read a lot of passages that show this, but we have read enough of these passages, enough times that we ought to be familiar with some basic things that I don't have to prove to you or show you. A state religion like Lutheranism in Germany or the Anglican Church in England, state church. So that's the way it was in Israel in the northern kingdom. That helps explain the presence at the time of Ahab's reign of such strong dominant personalities as Elijah and Elisha. Prophets, great prophets, prophets of faith, miracles. And also the presence of good kings down in Judah, that little kingdom, you see. It explains the presence of good kings during Ahab's reign like Asa and Jehoshaphat because the kings of Judah were not much better than the kings of Israel for the most part. There was not a single good king in Israel, the whole line, as you remember, but a few good ones in Judah. Well, let's look at the terms, what we're talking about, see what they mean. Baalism, if you were pronouncing that, those of you who have studied Hebrew here, it would be Baal. And the meaning of Baal, that was not a name of a foreign god at first because that's just a word which means several things, like it means owner. A bird's wings, it is said that he's the Baal of his wings. He owns his wings. It's used all through the Old Testament, Baal. Of owner, someone who owns something. It means husband. It came to have a bad meaning, but 
It means husband. Even in modern Hebrew today, a husband over in Israel is called a Baal. Now, they're not calling him Baal like the pagan god, but it's just a word which means husband. In fact, God is called Baal in some passages, or Baal, but with a small b, that he is the husband of Israel or the master of Israel in that sense. It means in the third place, Lord, Lord, our ruler, Lord in the sense of a deity. Our Lord in the sense, like Sarah called her husband, Lord, small l. And it's in this sense that it came to be applied to the Canaanite deity and the Philistine deity. Baal or Baal was the god of more than one culture. But you see, in Canaan, he's the chief god. And that's where Israel comes in, into Canaan, Palestine. And he's a nature god. And since they're going to be farmers and no longer so much sheep herders, although they were that too, but they're going to have to learn from the Canaanites all about farming. And since Baalism was a form of nature worship, you see how they went right together. By learning the agriculture of Palestine, they also learned the religion. And that's why God said, wipe the Canaanites out. We'll get to that a little later. Baal, anyway, came to mean the God of the Canaanites, the God of the Philistines, and other cultures. And he's to be equated with the Babylonian God, Baal is his name. B-E-L, Baal. And then two other female deities that they worshipped in Palestine with all sorts of sexual impurities. You see it all through the Old Testament, the Asherah, Hebrew pronunciation would be Asherah, A-S-H-E-R-A-H, and Ashtoret, A-S-H-T-O-R-E-T. Ashtoreth, translated in the King James as Ashtoreth, A-S-T-H-E-R-E-T-H, but we taught you here modern pronunciation. Now, Asherah was the mother of Baal, and Ashtoreth was the consort of Baal. Now, these names occur repeatedly in the Old Testament, and it's the worst form of idolatry that you run into. Ashtarot is the same as Ishtar from Babylon, I-S-H-T-A-R, Ishtar from Babylon, or Astarte, A-S-T-A-R-T-E, Astarte. And you probably know her as Venus. When you get over to Rome, it's the same goddess, sexual goddess, because they worshiped her with sexual excesses. Now that's why you need to read the article because I've simply given you some terminology and you need to read the articles because it's quite complicated to get all of these gods and goddesses of Canaan straightened out. But basically it's these three. And according to 1 Kings 18, no less than 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Asherah were supported by Jezebel. That's about a thousand. She brought Baalism in from Phoenicia under the reign of Ahab. And she decreed that Baalism was going to be the state religion and she persecuted and killed all the prophets of God. And in 1 Kings 18, we read how that Obadiah hid a hundred of them away in a cave. That's not the prophet Obadiah, but the Obadiah, who was in charge of Ahab's house, but he was a worshiper of God. And temples of Baal are mentioned in 1 Kings 16, 32, and in 2 Kings 11, 18. They'd been erected, of course, by Ahab and Jezebel. Now, Baal worship, which is the great threat to Israel's religion, had two main aspects. One was sacrifice, and the other was the festivals. And the sacrifices included among normal things like sacrifices that you'd make to any deity, any pagan culture would, but their sacrifices included human sacrifice. Is one reason that it was such an abomination to God and to 
true worshipers. So sacrifices included human sacrifice. And then the festivals, there were three a year in the spring and early summer and fall. And it's in these festivals when the worship of the goddesses came into prominence. And the goddesses are fertility goddesses. And they were worshipped, well, not only through singing and dancing, but also all sorts of sexual uncleanness. And it's interesting that the evergreen tree was the symbol for the goddess, Ashtoreth, her symbol, the Christmas tree. Oh, I shouldn't have said that that way. But that's what it is. See, the Christians to this hour who celebrate Christmas can't tell you why they cut down a perfectly good tree, deck it with silver and gold, and nail it to the floor, as it were, and then start bowing down before it. In many ways they do. And if you read Jeremiah 10, you can find out why they do that. Because it's a symbol, like it was to Ashtoreth, it was a symbol of immortality. And so again we see the tree coming from Babylon through pagan worship into Palestine where they cut down trees and deck them with silver and gold, Jeremiah 10, and bow down before them and said, Thou art my God. And the worship of Ashtoreth and Asherah were worshipped, as you see, all through kings in the Old Testament in the groves, groves of evergreen trees. Her symbol was either a pole, a tree stump, or the tree itself, Asherah or Ashtoreth. They get kind of confusing in trying to explain them, but if you think of them as the way we gave it, as Asherah, as the mother of Baal, we could go on and give more information about her. She's the wife or consort of Ael, E-L, but then you get into too many other deities. And so these are the ones that are mentioned. In connection with her worship, we have what we've mentioned before in some other connection, temple prostitution, both male and female prostitutes in the worship of Baal and Asherah and Ashtoreth. Another reason why God forbade the Israelites to allow the Canaanites to live because he sent them in there to wipe out this filth, as we've taught you many times, that his judgment upon them had the cup of iniquity. He said to Abraham, is not yet filled, so your descendants will be in Egypt for 400 years. After that, I'll bring them out and send them into the land. And the reason he said that it would be yet four centuries before Abraham's descendants could inherit the land that God promised Abraham was their cup of iniquity, the Canaanites, is not yet full. So he gave them four more centuries. And Israel was supposed to wipe them out, which she didn't do, and as a result, why, God lost nearly all of them but 7,000 because he didn't obey him. So you can't fellowship with the world and not be tainted by it or hurt by it. A lot of sermons could be drawn from that, obviously. Well, anyway, both male and female prostitutes. In Baalism, in the worship of Baal and the goddesses, the plant cycle became a typical presentation or duplication of the so-called birth and life and then death of Baal himself. Let me explain what I mean. And you find this in Babylon too. In the fall, when the vegetation would wither and die, that would signify the death of Baal. You see, their worship of Baal was inseparably related to the cycle of the crops. So when Baal died, then vegetation died. And so those who worshipped him would weep and pull their hair and cut themselves and all these things we see in 1 Kings, for example, in Elijah's contact with the prophets of Baal. And then when the new growth would come in the spring, that signified his rebirth. And of course, while it was growing, would be his life presented. And so it's with his rebirth that they would have the festivals. And in the midst of their dancing and singing, they would have all sorts of sexual practices that made it such an abomination. Of course, Israel was not immune to that which brings us to the danger of Baalism to Israel. And that's twofold. The danger of Baalism to Israel was twofold. That is, it stemmed from two standpoints. First of all, Baalism appealed to their flesh. Like in Satanism, they could gratify their flesh and worship their God at the same time. 
That's what about Satanism today appeals to some people. They can gratify the flesh and worship their God. So that was the first threat to Israel. And the second threat to Israel stemmed from the necessary change that had to take place when she entered Canaan. Now remember, you know your Old Testament well enough, I'm sure, that God made no exceptions. They were to go in and to destroy the wicked Canaanites. If they didn't, he said, there would be thorns in your sides. They didn't do that. And so the second threat came from the necessary changes that had to take place when they came out of Egypt as brickmakers and cattlemen and so forth and came into Palestine. They were going to settle down, plant vineyards, raise crops, of course build cities and that sort of thing. And the second danger lies in the fact that when they came into Palestine, they had everything to learn. I mean, if you leave here and go to Iowa or New Mexico to live and you're a farmer, you have to learn all the new techniques about the climate, the tools, rainfall. It doesn't matter how much you know about farming, you start over, as it were. So they had everything to learn and guess who they looked to to teach them? The ones they should have eliminated, the Canaanites. And so the Canaanites, along with their lessons about agriculture, they transferred the magic of their religion because you couldn't separate Baalism, Baal worship, from their crops, that is, agriculture, because it's a fertility cult. So they transferred the magic of the religion, that is, how do you get a crop? Well, you go to the temples and shrines of Baal and Ashtar and Ashtoreth. At certain seasons of the year, you participate in sexual orgies, and that is kind of a sympathetic magic that causes the crops then to reproduce. You see, as you are going through the act of reproducing, that's supposed to be what mating was for in Genesis. Today, mating is just the physical aspect too often, which is another subject, but anyway. Nature was supposed to participate in the sexual rites because, you see, the worship of Baal and his consorts was inseparably related to the plant cycle and to nature and agriculture. And that's why God said to wipe them out because if you don't, while you're learning about nature from the Canaanites, you're going to learn about the worship of nature from the Canaanites. And with it went all of the excesses, child sacrifice and sinful practices. Well, that in essence is Baalism in the Old Testament. Now, there's a whole lot more you can say, but that's a summary of why it plays such an important part in Old Testament studies. Because it was the greatest single threat to the worship, true worship of Yahweh, the God of Israel. Now we're going to skip, as I said, prophetism. Now we come to typology. You see that on your outline? Typology. That's way over the bottom of page 13. Now, just like Baalism is a very important aspect of study, so is typology. I'm avoiding being pessimistic, but I doubt that everyone really understood the importance of us dealing with Baalism. As you do your independent study, you'll find out God thought it was so important that he raised up a prophet like Elijah and Elisha to deal with it for one purpose. Elijah's ministry was against Baalism. What do you suppose he's doing in all those chapters in 1 Kings? What's Elijah doing? Now we come to typology, the justification. Typological interpretation, what's its justification? Because you see, a lot of people spiritualize, typify, allegorize the Bible. They just make it mean what they want. And if you don't believe the mess that gets you into, read any commentary of your choice on any subject in the Bible. But especially take something like Ezekiel chapters 40 to 48, filled with detail, and those who give it the allegorical interpretation, which most do, they have to spiritualize it because they can't take it literally. If they did that, they'd be premillennial. If they were premillennial, they'd be fundamentalists. And they'd be fundamentalists, nobody would like them because they believe the Bible literally. 
But there is a justification for typological interpretation and symbolical interpretation because the Bible itself enters into it. I'd like to give you, to begin with, about five reasons for the justification for typological interpretation of the Old Testament. Five reasons. Now, do you understand what we're starting to deal with? That there can be a type in the Old Testament, like the Passover? But that isn't what God was teaching alone, a memorial back to their deliverance from Egypt. It symbolized that, but it was a type of the great anti-type, A-N-T-I type, who was Jesus, and he's called the Passover in the New Testament. And that's what the Passover in Exodus 12 was all about. And so there you see the justification for typological interpretation of many things in the Old Testament. Now, not the whole Old Testament. You know, every detail can't have a meaning. Or we're back to the problem of the commentaries. And whoever you read is going to have a different interpretation. All right, five reasons to justify type and anti-type. First of all is the inseparable relationship between the two testaments. You see that just by reading the two. Some need to read the old to see it's the foundation of the new. Just the general relationship that exists between the two testaments. You see that one is the basis for the other and much in the old is fulfilled in the new. Well, you know that, but you see you didn't Know it in this sense, maybe. A second reason is Christ's own use of the Old Testament. And his invitation to find him predicted and typified there. How often did he appeal to the Old Testament to say, that's really talking about me. Moses spoke of me, he said in the Gospel of John. Moses spoke of me. You're searching the scriptures. Well, he said Moses was speaking of me. You're looking for the Messiah through the dead letter of the word. Well, he said, here is Messiah. Moses was writing of me. He said, Abraham saw my day. And after he was resurrected in Luke 24, he appealed to the law, the prophets, and the Psalms and said, they spoke of me. And said, they spoke of my death my sufferings, after three days I must be raised. Now where do you find that? Isaiah 53 speaks of his death, but where does it speak of his death and sufferings and three days in the grave? Well, Jonah. They were supposed to know that Jonah, prophetically, in the whale three days, typified him. And one day he appealed to it. He said, As Jonah was in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the Son of Man. So Jesus himself invites us to find him there typified. I just gave you three examples. And then thirdly, another reason for the justification of typological interpretation of the Old Testament is the vocabulary of the New Testament with reference to the Old. The vocabulary of the New Testament with reference to the Old. Constant references show type and anti-type. And then fourthly, the apostles typological use of the Old Testament. They themselves point out types in the New Testament. The apostles. Not just Jesus, but the apostles. Now you can find these types. We're not, at this point, giving you all the types, but just stating why we can make a typological interpretation. And then fifthly, we see that Type is a kind of prophecy. You see, the strong prophetic element in the Old Testament justifies the principle that the new is latent in the old and the old is patent in the new. The New Testament is latent in the old and the old is patent in the new. Anything that's latent is like an image on a negative. It's there, but you just don't see it yet. And what's patent is evident. That's all patent means. It's evident, clear. The strong use, emphasis upon prophecy all through the Old Testament justifies that principle that you can find 
that inseparable relation. The image of the new is there in the old, it's in seed form. And then in the new, you find the old come into full bloom. Now having said that, I want to say something else, that prophecy can take two forms along the line we're talking. It can be verbally predictive, that is a prophecy in words. Prophecy can be verbally predictive or typically predictive. In other words, a type can be a prophecy without saying a word about it. The former verbally predictive prophecy would be those obvious prophecies like Zechariah. That's 99% future. Verbally predictive in words. Zechariah or Isaiah 53 speaking of the atonement. Death on the cross. And typically predictive prophecies would be those typical persons, places, things, events that picture something in the future. Like the sacrifices, they meant to the Israelites they were forgiven. But those sacrifices, every one of them, as we've shown you through Old Testament theology, every one of those pointed to the Lamb of God and said something distinctive about his death on the cross. But you see, the sacrifices, the lamb that was getting ready to be killed didn't say, now wait, I'm a type. Let me explain this to you. Nor did the priest say it's a type. They didn't think in terms of types. They thought in terms of obeying God. I sacrifice this lamb as a sin offering and here's the consequence. I get forgiven. They were prophecies about what Messiah would do. They weren't word prophecies. That's just an example. The high priesthood, the high priest himself typified the great high priest. You see that in the New Testament. Now he fulfills that office and he is the great high priest. Moses said there's going to be a prophet like me that you'll listen to. You see, Moses was a type of Christ's prophetic ministry. And then David, as you know, was a type of Christ, his kingship. Of course, David, in more than one way, typified Christ. So a prophecy can be predictive in words or predictive in things or actions or events. And what we're saying is that this is the fifth way in which we can justify the typological interpretation of the Old Testament, that is many aspects of it, is because a type itself is a kind species of prophecy. And a prophecy is not something that comes to pass when you prophesy it, but you see the Old Testament prophecy in the form of a type was fulfilled in the New. Therefore, we can look back now and say that was a type. The Passover was a type of the antitype Passover, Jesus Christ. The book of Hebrews will bring everything into focus we've said because over and over and over there you see the antitype. Jesus and so on. And he keeps speaking there of better things to come, that we've got a better sacrifice, a better high priest, better everything. And he tells us in Hebrews chapter 10 that these things in the Old Testament were just shadows of what we have in reality now. The very fact he says they're shadows, we see they're types. Jesus invites you to see him typified there. Don't be afraid to get into Levitical sacrifice, temple, the altar, showbread, and all of that, and see Jesus, our New Testament truth, typified there. But watch that you don't make every detail of everything a type. Now, when we get on down to page 14, we're going to skip D and E on the outline because we've already covered the symbolism and typical nature of the tabernacle, priesthood, sacrifices, and all of that. See, we covered that when we dealt with Old Testament sacrifices and the temple and all of that. Don't be afraid to find types in the Old Testament. But unless you know it's a type, then you better be honest and say when you preach your sermon or teach your devotional at the ladies' luncheon or whatever, this suggests to me thus and so. <laughs> then we'll know where you got it from. And that's valid. There's nothing wrong with that. This passage suggests to me, and I believe the Lord wants me to share this with you. We'll show a little later that Paul does that, except his ended up being scripture and yours won't. 
He draws an analogy in one passage and tells us he's doing it. We'll get to that later. Now let's look at the distinction between the allegorical and typical or typological interpretation of the Old Testament. The reason we have to make a distinction is because some interpreters identify the two. They say, well, allegorical interpretation, typical interpretation, same things, but they're really not. But we have to, first of all, before we can get into the allegorical interpretation, understand what an allegory is, an allegory, because Paul, as I said, makes an allegory out of a passage. So before you can understand allegorical interpretation, what's an allegory? Let me give you a definition. Allegory is a symbolical narrative in which every detail has a figurative meaning. An allegory is a symbolical narrative in which every detail has a figurative meaning. Now, can you think in religious literature of an allegory that every detail has a figurative meaning? Pilgrim's progress. Everything. Dotting castle. Pilgrim is the pilgrim passing through. Pilgrim's progress. And he comes to Dotting Castle and the giant in there. You remember him? And the Slav despondency. The mud that he had to go through and he got into despondency. One of the characters is talkative. He talks a big Christian experience and witness, but in time of testing, he's like so many, just fades away. Then in the Bible, you've got a lot of allegories in the book of Ezekiel. And there you have the allegory, for example, a long one in chapter 16. I think it's the whole chapter of the foundling child. F-O-U-N-D-L-I-N-G, foundling child. God found Israel like a baby wallowing in its afterbirth that everybody who saw it just turned and walked away. She was nothing. And God said, I saw you like that, and I took you, and I cleaned you up, and dressed you in the best clothes, ring for your finger, gave you everything, and then you went after other lovers. Now, a common error of a lot of teachers and interpreters is the attempt to allegorize the parables of Jesus and make every detail have a meaning. You know, like the mustard seed that grew up to be a big tree and the fowls of the air came and lighted in the branches and they tell us what the fowls represent and on and on and on. Every detail has a meaning when the parables are to teach one central lesson, you see. Now, that doesn't mean that there can't be a whole message drawn from one parable. I'm not saying that. Like I have a message I preached on the parable of the pearl. Well, that's a very short parable. And it's teaching one lesson, the value of the kingdom. You sell all to purchase it. You forsake all. Well, you see, that's all it's teaching. It's not how big the pearl was, what kind of a pearl. We're not to allegorize the parables. Now, Ezekiel's style is quite unique, and so if we ever teach the major and minor prophets, this will really be an interesting book to get into, but he uses allegory all through there. His book is filled with allegories. For example, he portrays nations under the personification of animals and plants and other people. For example, Jerusalem and Samaria he makes an allegory out of them and he calls them prostitutes. They're two prostitutes. Well, that was pretty good because by that time, that's the way they were acting. The house of David, he compares in an allegory to a lion's den. I could give you the references on those. Jerusalem and Samaria prostitutes, Ezekiel 23, 4. The house of David is a lion's den, 19, 1. Or sometimes it's a vine, like 19, 10 and 17, 6. Egypt is a crocodile. 32.1. The Chaldeans are depicted as an eagle. 17.3. And Israel in exile is depicted as what? A valley full of dead bones. That brings us now to allegorical interpretation of the Bible. You see, as we said, some say that 
to interpret the Old Testament figuratively in many respects is using allegory, which is not a good way to interpret. And a lot of people do allegorize the Old Testament, and we'll get to the misuse of it later, but the allegorical interpretation of the Old Testament can be a valid method of interpretation if it's done properly. It's invalid when you try to find Greek philosophy in it, as Origen did. He found some Platonic philosophy in the Old Testament, he thought. But it can be valid when the interpreter advises you he's interpreting this passage allegorically, and he wants to bring a deeper spiritual understanding of the passage to you by making an allegory out of it. Now, to show you that's valid, Paul does that in Galatians 4. And you'll want to turn there. Verse 21, Galatians 4. Tell me, you the desire to be under the law, do you not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a slave woman, a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh. That's Ishmael. But he of the free woman, born after the promise, made to Abraham, Isaac. Now look at this. Which things are an allegory? Now you see, if we hadn't had that study, you wouldn't know what he's talking about here. Which things are an allegory? For these, that is, these two women and these two sons, what they gendered by birth, they are two covenants, the old and new, of course. The ones from Mount Sinai, which is the law, and that genders bondage. In other words, a slave woman can only produce a slave son. So all who want to be under the law are still slaves to the law, and that's Hagar. But this Hagar is Mount Sinai in Arabia and answereth to the Jerusalem, which now is, that is Paul's day, and it's in bondage to this hour with her children, he's saying. He's talking about the Jews who are still under law. They're in bondage. But Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So out of Hagar and Sarah and Ishmael and Isaac, he makes an allegory. He says, I'm going to make an allegory out of it. It refers to Mount Sinai and the law, and to Jerusalem after the physical or flesh, and to the Jerusalem that is spiritual, and the covenants. See, all of this is allegorized. Now, when he says these two women and the teaching concerning their being one bond and free, when he said these things are an allegory and that these women are two covenants, he doesn't mean the Genesis narrative is an allegory. We're to take that literally. That was history. See, that actually happened. There was a Sarah. There was a Hagar. So we're not to spiritualize it. So it doesn't mean that the Genesis narrative was an allegory, but he's saying, I'm going to make an allegory out of that historical period, or women, or the covenants and all. I'm going to make an allegory out of it. And he does this by making an allegory out of a historical narrative and then interpreting it allegorically for a deeper spiritual lesson to give to us, the church. And you see, that's valid. God let him do it. That's a part of scripture, to make an allegory out of a historical passage, which you can do if you tell people you're doing it. He did. He didn't say they were an allegory. He said, I'm going to make an allegory out of it, because we know that uh, it is an allegory. He wouldn't have had to told us. But some, of course, misuse allegory. And that brings us to its misuse. To give an example of what we mean by misuse, interpreters down through history, and especially there seemed to be quite a bit of allegorical interpretation in the second century by the theologians and interpreters, they believe that everything in the Old Testament like the parables of Jesus in the New had a figurative meaning. You were to find a hidden meaning in everything. And as a result, to give you some examples, the Garden of Eden is a type of the church. Of course, Adam and Eve and their pure state, and then the church became apostate, and so forth. So you can get all sorts of references or ideas out of it. The six days of creation typified there would only be 6,000 years of history. The world would last 6,000 years. 
six days of creation. The number of Abraham's servants, and we're told how many he had, the number of Abraham's servants constitute the numerical equivalent of the first two Greek letters for Jesus. If you write Jesus in Greek, plus the tau, T, which looks like a cross, signified his cross. So what we've got typified in the number of Abraham's servants is Jesus and his cross. Well, you can see it got a little out of hand. And as someone said, every piece of wood in the Old Testament became a symbol of the cross to these men, and every pool of water signified baptism. Now, let me give you a definition of typological interpretation. We gave you a definition of allegorical interpretation, allegory. And typological interpretation is based upon the theological unity that exists between the two testaments. The theological unity that exists between the two testaments whereby something in the old shadows or prefigures something in the new. It is not something superimposed upon the Old Testament, but is the result of divine intention. That's what we mean by typological interpretation of the Old Testament. It's not something you try to find a type and superimpose it there, but God divinely intended there should be a relationship. The Passover is a good example, and there are many of them. In fact, all the sacrifices, practically all the ritual, tabernacle, priesthood, altar, the cross is right there in the tabernacle, you see. The whole book of Ezekiel practically is typical or there's much typology in it. An example of type from another prophet, Hosea 11.1. 1. Hosea said, out of Egypt I've called my son. He's talking about Israel. Hosea 11.1. 1. But it was a type. Hosea didn't know it. People didn't know it at the time. But Matthew knew it by the inspiration of the Spirit because in Matthew 2.15... He said, when the angel appeared to Joseph and said, Herod's dead, come on back to Palestine, he said, this happened to fulfill the prophecy of Hosea, whereby God said, I've called my son out of Egypt. We well, see there, we see it really applied to Jesus. Jesus went to Egypt just like Israel went to Egypt. And so, by divine intention, there's a type and antitype. I'm not going to deal, as the outline shows, with objections to this. The answers are so obvious, I think in a sentence we could answer those. We've got a heading here, objections to the typical nature of the Old Testament, sacrifices and institutions. Why was not their typical and symbolical character taught in the Pentateuch? You see, I would get a question like that in my research from the critical liberals and so forth who were always picking at the Bible. So why was not their typical or symbolical character taught to the Old Testament Israelites? Well, then that would defeat the purpose of a type. See, you say, well, now these really don't mean what you think they do, and they're really not important, these animal sacrifices and sin offerings and all. You see, they couldn't approach it in those terms. We had to wait until the full revelation came which really answers the second objection, what meaning could Mosaic worship have for the people of its own day if the institutions were typical and symbolical? Well, the point is they were not merely typical and symbolical because the institutions like sacrifice, priesthood, and so forth were adequate for the dispensation they were intended to serve. The Old Testament saint, he didn't say, oh, this is just a shadow of better things to come. No, you had to wait till the book of Hebrews to get that. Because God, as we stressed when we taught on this, said again and again, if you'll perform the ritual from your heart and offer the sacrifices, that will be an atonement for your sin and you shall be forgiven. 
So the animal sacrifices provided forgiveness and enabled them to stay in covenant standing. But as we taught you when we taught sacrifice, they didn't purge away sins. God didn't say they did in the Old Testament. He never once says the animal sacrifices can take away sins because they can't. But he said, I'll forgive you if you obey me and do it the way I say because they were types of Christ. And again and again in Leviticus we read, and he shall be forgiven. Now you can't make God out a liar. You better get your theology straight. They did receive forgiveness. But then Paul reconciles it in Romans 3, 24, 25 when he said that God was merely passing over, as it were, all of the forgiveness obtained by animal sacrifice until the fullness of times, Jesus would validate all that forgiveness and purge away sin with his blood. We've more or less covered point C, arguments for the symbolic and typical nature of the Old Testament. The Mosaic rites were incomplete and preparatory. It explains itself here under that heading. That's what Hebrews 10 tells you. They were just shadows. And the justification or arguments for symbolic typical nature is the correspondence between the Levitical ritual and sacrifices and that of Christ. You see that, for example, in that the sacrifice had to be a pure, unblemished animal, which alone could typify Christ's holiness. It had to be clean symbolically and typically. And the fact that it became a substitute for the sinner, like Jesus did. You see the correspondence between Levitical sacrifice and the sacrifice of Christ is what we're talking about. The penal sufferings and death that the animal had to suffer. That spoke of Christ's suffering our guilt, the penalty of it. Prophetic testimony, the prophets speak of an age to come that will complete the one they're in. That is to say, you find threading throughout the prophets references and they themselves didn't know all the meaning, of course. We're told that in the New Testament. But you find references to the fact that what Ezra received was incomplete. Now, when he was making a sacrifice, he didn't say, hey, incomplete, this is just a type of shadow. We've already dealt with that. But the prophets, threading throughout the prophecies, and to see these things shows the difference between people who read the Bible and people who study the Bible because they miss these things. But you'll find, like Jeremiah says, the time will come when there will be no need of the Ark of the Covenant. Well, that was the big thing in the temple. That was God's throne. And here, a prophet saying, one day we'll not have it, not need it. He's saying, you see, through prophecy, that it's really just typical. There's a better age coming when something else will replace it. But see, you don't get that like a whole chapter on, one day we won't need the Ark. It just is there, threading itself through. Like so many of the things that the prophets say. This is Psalm 110. The Lord said to my Lord, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. We see all of the Old Testament priests were after the order of Aaron. But here's someone, and they know it's Messiah because they know their Messianic prophecies. Messiah is going to be a high priest replacing all other high priests, and he'll be after the order of Melchizedek, a greater priesthood. Like Moses talking about, you're not listening to me, Israel, but he said, one day a prophet will come, you will hear, or you better hear, is what he means by it. Because he says, God will cut off everyone who doesn't hear him. And so, so many prophetic statements that this Old Testament age is kind of an incomplete age. How Messiah will become the sacrifice, you see. Pious Jews, those who want to go deeper than Sunday school, would have to think about that. We're offering animal sacrifices, but one day here Messiah himself is going to offer his soul as an offering for sin. His life literally, nephish, the life will be a trespass offering, Isaiah 53.10. And then the New Testament evidence we've given you, where Jesus invites you to find him there. Read Luke 24 and Colossians 2, verse 17, where Paul said, these things are just a shadow. Read the book of Hebrews, chapter 10, where he said, these things were but shadows of better things to come. So you find all through the New Testament references to the fact that those things just typified what we now have in reality. They were physical 
literal types of the great antitype, Jesus Christ, and his work, his redeeming work. So the typological interpretation of the Old Testament is valid when it's done properly, when there is a type and antitype. We don't apologize for it here. So that you understand when we criticize those for their methods of spiritualizing the baptism of the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues, healing. New Jerusalem is us. It's not a literal city coming down that we'll live in. When they start spiritualizing it, you don't want to confuse that with typology or even symbol because those things are valid. That is, they have a valid place. And spiritualizing does not have a valid place because that means that you're taking something literal, spiritualizing it. So I said to someone recently, some things have a spiritual meaning, but that's not spiritualizing. Like when Jesus said, I'm a door, you know he's not a door. But when you take something that is literal, like divine healing, and make a spiritual application out of that, that that means healing your sins, you see that's spiritualizing, James 5. But obviously, he's not a vine and we're not literal branches any more than he's a literal shepherd and we're literal ba sheep or lambs. I didn't hear anyone say bye. If you said anything, you said amen or whatever. And so you're not spiritualizing to say, no, wait, that's not literal. It's spiritual. He is a shepherd in the sense that he takes care of us. He guides us. He's concerned for us because he says the false shepherds flee when trouble comes. And we're lambs like lambs ought to follow and listen to the voice of their shepherd. It's important, very important, we understand how to interpret the Bible, the Old Testament, because if you don't understand how to interpret it, and there are types and symbols and allegories even, like all through Ezekiel, you never really will get straightened out. You get over in the book of Revelation, you've got Daniel, you've got Ezekiel, and they lift right out of there things that they speak about in their books. And so what are you going to do with it over there? in Revelation. So as a result, the church of our day spiritualizes the whole book of Revelation. It's past history, by the way. If you've been to church recently and they taught on book of Revelation, it's all past. The remarkable thing is, it's just starting to happen. For the most part, for the most part. 